delayed a few minutes. So those who are several minutes late are here. Probably have some more people at the end, but I'm going to go ahead and start. And uh, it's all right with you. I'd like to ask God's blessing on our, uh, our effort to understand how to better take care of this thing. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being together. I ask that you uh, give me words to speak, give us ears to hear. And uh, we want to honor and care for these physical bodies that you have created and made for us. So bless us with that effort, I pray in Jesus' name. I knew you'd be disappointed if I didn't show you a picture of my grandson. <laughs> His mommy, my daughter, my youngest daughter, loved baseball. She used to be a fan of the Seattle Mariners. She listened to every game. And when she came, when I got home from work, if it wasn't raining, this was in Seattle. If it wasn't raining or dark, she did her baseball bat and gloved and let daddy let's go play ball. So here's the kid can't even walk yet, but she's teaching him how to play ball. This is the wind-up and this is the pitch. <laughs> That kid is now six foot three inches tall. All right, what we're facing in America is not, not much of an issue when it comes to germs. Folks, please don't put up any chairs in the back until these are all filled. I'm an old teacher, but God forgive me. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, there's another 12 well, chairs, chairs up here. Our big problem in America, folks, is not germs. It's diseases that we call chronic conditions. And drugs do not cure them. And the one I want to look at for a few minutes to begin with this evening is heart disease. But we are afflicted by all kinds of situations that are caused by lifestyle, not by germs. And some examples are heart disease, cancer. Uh, cancer is not caused by a germ. It is caused always by mutations. We will look at this later. I, I mentioned to you last evening, it's mutations in the DNA, and there is no exception to this that causes cancer. You might be interested to know what the number one risk factor for cancer is. Anybody want to guess, or does anybody know? Overweight. The number one risk factor for cancer. What percentage of Americans are overweight? It's 70 plus. It's actually 70.4 percent. It's been climbing for a long time. This is a new figure. Uh, in other words, Mutations. There's a lot of things that cause mutations in the DNA. But when we have too much weight, uh, it interrupts with our body's ability to repair the DNA. And uh, so it is the number one cause for cancer. It's amazing. Uh, diabetes is a lifestyle disease. And I told you yesterday, whenever I use the term diabetes, what am I really saying? Type 2. If I don't mention one of the others. Uh, high blood pressure. Virtually curable with lifestyle. There could be, in some cases, some unusual genetic issue, but it's very, very rare. Um, overweight, of course. Arthritis. Um, not entirely curable by lifestyle, but largely curable. Um, very interesting. Uh, uh, osteo and rheumatoid arthritis respond to lifestyle. Fibromyalgia, you all know about that, don't you? We're not saying yes or not anymore. It's like it's an inflammation of the tendons and the joints, and in its most difficult form, every joint in somebody's body hurts, every tendon hurts. And I don't know if I mentioned this, I don't think I did. Uh, when I was working at Weimar Institute uh, several years back now, 
I met with the new group. I was the vice president. I met with the new group every two and a half weeks. Actually, every three weeks. They were there for two and a half. There was a little break, and then we started another group. This is a lifestyle program, most of you, I think, know, where people come and pay $6,500 to learn to um, change their lifestyle and get well. And we were in a group, about 25 people, uh, two or three staff members, and the rest were guests. And, but there was a lady laying on the floor. She had about three pillows. And you just look at that woman's face and you can tell something is dreadfully wrong. She was laying there trying to find some position with these pillows where the pain would be a little less. Fibromyalgia. I saw her on, did I tell you this story? Okay. Uh, I saw her on campus here and there, but about a week and a half, I just bumped into her. And so I'm going to visit with her and see how she was doing. I'll never forget her words. She said, my pain is virtually gone. How long? I guess I'm not communicating. I just told you how long it was before I saw her. A week and a half. And uh, I don't, don't misunderstand this. I don't blame the physicians, folks. But they are not taught that lifestyle will cure these things or make them much better. And why are they not taught that? I think I mentioned this yesterday. Why teach physicians to tell their people what they can do to get well if they won't do it? Why bother? In fact, even people who pay $6,500 to go to Weimar for two and a half weeks. I don't think I told you this, I may have. I'm talking all the time everywhere and I can't remember what I said with one group or the other. And I attended every graduation for two years. Dr. Nenley asked me to be the administrator for two years till he could get there. And um, you listen to these people, it's, it's fun. And they are just glowing and they are well and they are feeling better than they felt usually in years. Um, would you like to guess what percentage of them go home and stay on the program? One out of ten. By the way, you guys in the back row are in illegal seats. <laughs> Next time we have a break, you've got to come up and take these chairs. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll be double the charge. <laughs> By the way, this book that's near some of you is Nita's uh, third cookbook over a period of 45 years. And uh, there's a few of these for sale if you want them. You have to talk to the people over there about that. Uh, you're welcome to not buy one and, and be looking through it when Neva comes up and does recipe demonstrations. If you'd like to buy one, just put your name on it and then pay the people it whenever you can. Because if you don't put your name on it and you're taking notes, which you probably will want to do when Neva's making the demonstrations, uh, you lay it down somewhere, they all look the same. You understand? So if you're going to, anytime, today or tomorrow, you want to buy one. Just put your name in it and then take care of it over there. So where was I? One out of ten. After paying how much money? Sixty-five hundred. Now listen, every one of those people went home intending to do this. Y'all with me on that? They're, they're going to do it. They know why they got well. You should hear the testimonies. They're incredible. In fact, anytime you're driving through Central California, uh, if it's Wednesday night, uh, and get online and see if a session is ending at Weimar and call up and say uh, uh, they called me Pastor Brackett when I was working there. Pastor Brackett gave me permission to come and attend the graduation. I'd like to come. Is that okay? <laughs> Probably nobody ever remembers it anymore. But that might get you in. But it's fun to listen to folks because they just are like I say, they are just Glowing with satisfaction and gratitude. Uh, why is it so hard to go home and do this? Well, it's different. You guys are so quiet. Neighborhood intro. Pardon me? Neighborhood intro. Well, maybe the neighborhood, yeah. But it is so different, folks, from what most people are doing. 
And so, it's, if you will, it's hard. It's funny. My wife and I have been living like this ourselves for 53 years. And uh, it seems easy to us because we just do this all the time. But I realize it's tricky. And it's easy to go back to the old ways. But I'll tell you what, folks, if you just, if you determine to do this, you will be well like you probably have never been in your life. It's amazing the problems that we face that uh, just get better. Uh, kidney stones. There would be no kidney stones in America if people lived like this. And you all know that those are fairly common. Uh, lupus, another autoimmune disease that is curable with lifestyle. Uh, sometimes these arthritic-like situations don't completely go away. The average improvement that the Weimar physicians will say is about 50% relief from symptoms. Some people get 90 plus percent. Some people only get 10 to 20. So there are cases that aren't as good as this lady that was laying on the floor, but everybody gets significant improvement. Kidney failure. Number one cause of kidney failure, you know what it is? In America? It's diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And how many people uh, have diabetes in America today? One out of how many people have diabetes in America? It's one out of 12. It's going to be one out of four by 2050, according to the authorities, if you will. So it's a big issue. Claudication is actually the same uh, problem that happens in the heart. It happens in the legs. Uh, you may not remember this from yesterday. But uh, this plaque that builds up in our arteries, is it, am I okay using that term? Are you all with me in what I'm talking about? It builds up in arteries anywhere, not just the heart. The place that kills people the most is in the heart. And then the next place is in the brain. Uh, the atherosclerotic plaque can kill you by closing up one of your arteries in your brain. But it happens in arteries all over the body. Sometimes kidney failure is caused by artery that goes to the kidney being clogged up with plaque. And if it happens in the legs, we call it claudication. I'm sure you've heard the term. So that can occur anywhere. But the big thing, of course, is because people die uh, from heart disease. Now, this is John McDougall. I mentioned to him yesterday. What, how, what percent of heart disease? Now, listen, there's many, many kinds of heart disease conditions. When we just say heart disease to each other, we usually mean coronary artery disease. Are you all with me on that? So that's what I mean when I use that term without clarifying it. What percent of coronary artery disease in this country could be prevented by lifestyle? 100%. This is astonishing, folks. Not with bypass surgery. Are you aware of the fact that when they do bypass surgery, and I won't ask you to raise your hand, I, I would imagine somebody in here, maybe more than one, had that surgery, most of the time they use a vein from your leg to replace or bypass an artery. Sometimes the mammary artery is in position, depending on what, uh, where, the, where the blockage is in the heart, the mammary artery is in position. There are two of them, so if you take one of them and move it to the heart, uh, you can do that. But most of the time it's a vein. Once in a while, in recent years, they've been using they have two arteries in the arm, so they use one of them. Take a piece of it out, and it's no longer being used in for your arm. Uh, they'll sometimes use that. But it's still very common to use a vein. The average, the average time for one of those veins that is bypassing the clog up is less than seven years. Why is it clogging up? It actually clogs up faster than an artery would. But uh, why is it doing that? because people don't change their lifestyle. It's an amazing story. And, uh, but it's preventable. And not only that, if you got it, what do you know? 100% of it, folks, is reversible. This is John McDougall. And um, many of you are members of this local church here. You may not know that John McDougall did the lifestyle program at St. Helena, California Sanitarium for years. It's owned by the Adventist organization. 
he finally left. Do you know why he left? I'm embarrassed to tell you. The hospital was feeding the same kind of food that made people get heart disease. They were feeding that kind of food to their patients. And he finally just said, I'm out of here. And went to Santa Rosa and started an amazing program that he still operates today. This is how many 747s full of people die every day from heart disease in this country. I wish you all would pick up a little bit on that. You should have said, ooh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, it depends on how you do it, but this is around 350, 300, 400 people. Every day, folks, that many people die in this country. Are the family members heartbroken over these deaths? Yes. And is there, oh, it's incredible, folks, how we just walk along in life and accept all of this when it is completely what? Preventable. Astonishing. Six of these, actually, it's a little more than that, but I'm being on the conservative side. Now, there's many kinds of heart disease. This is the most common by far. Most everybody knows, I think you know, this is a question. Are you aware of the fact that the average American knows that saturated fat is bad for your heart? How many, since you're not talking to me, how many know that? Let me see your hands. Okay, most of you know. Yeah, those of you that didn't raise your hand, you know it now. Saturated fat. We know this um, contributes to heart disease. And I said yesterday, you can take any plant fat that's liquid. There's a couple of plants whose fat is solid. Coconut and palm. Palm oil or palm. The, the fat in the palm kernel. Uh, you can take any plant fat and replace some of the fat in people's diet that's saturated. Replace it. Remember that word. I mean, get that word. And heart disease, death will decrease by 50% at least. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> is that amazing or not? Yes. It is. And uh, I'm going to show you something very interesting. Most people know that this saturated fat is bad for your heart. And they believe that the unsaturated fat would be good for your heart. Are you all with me? Unfortunately, what does it say? That is not true. Everybody knows in America that olive oil is good for you, correct? No. Say yes, even though no. you heard differently no. yesterday. No. Um, it's not good for you. It's just less bad for you than saturated fat. Are you all with me on that? That's why I say, unfortunately, this idea that olive oil is good for you is not true. So. You remember, it's been at least 25 years ago that uh, word got out to the community of America that walnuts were good for your heart. Remember that, anybody? Okay, some of you aren't nodding, but now you know that that happened. I happen to know the science that we could study. He's a friend of mine. And uh, I actually attended the lecture that he gave to tell about his research. There's about 300 people there, lifestyle type folks that were there interested to know what was going on, and uh, he told about how you give um, wellness to people and they get better. There are less heart disease, less death, and uh, the average American kind of knows about that. Am I not correct? Most of you have heard of that. At the end of his lecture, uh, there's a Q&A, right? And I had the nerve to jump to my feet and raise my hand before anybody else among those 300 people. And I said to him, were these replacement studies? For some reason, he hadn't mentioned it in the lecture. And he said, oh, yes. What do you suppose he, what do you suppose I meant? And what do you suppose he meant when he said, yes, these were replacement studies? What do you suppose, based on what I've already said here? Close. They took some fat out of the people's diet and put walnuts, which are high in fat, 
same amount of fat that they took out, they gave them enough walnuts to give them that much fat. Are you all with me? And guess what? 30, 40, 50, 60 percent less death from heart disease just because they had a handful of walnuts a day. How many Americans on the street, if you ask them about this, would know that it was a replacement program? Just about zero. But do Americans know that walnuts are supposedly good for you? Say yes. yes. So what do they do then? After their regular terrible meal, they add some walnuts because they're good for you. And they are more worse off than they would have been otherwise. Are you tracking why? Because there's a whole bunch more what? Fat in the diet. This is how uninformed we are as Americans. It's, it's quite sad, quite pitiful. Now, since Dr. Sabate did that study, all the nuts that we commonly eat have been studied, and they all do the same thing. There's nothing special about walnuts. Those nuts mostly have unsaturated fat. Are you all with me on that idea? Does every plant have some fat in it? Say yes. Does every plant have some saturated fat in it? Say yes. But in almost all the plants, it's very little of the fat that is saturated. And so you can take any high fat plant, and there's more than nuts, what are the other ones? Avocados, nuts, and olives and seeds. Any of those things that are high in fat, you can take some fat out of people's diet and give them an olive or a nut or whatever, and they'll have less heart disease because you're replacing some of the saturated fat, which is bad for your heart by unsaturated fat. Go with me. So, you mean, is walnut oil good? No. At all. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want you to say that. You weren't here yesterday. Okay. All the plant oils, when you take them out of the plant, are oxidized and they become carcinogens. They become inflammatory products in your body. Are you all with me on that? Yes. So, I, I'm sorry that I answered the question the way I did. Eating the oil in the walnut is just fine because I didn't take it out and let it get oxidized. Are you all with me? Thank you. I'll let okay. you take them away from me. Yeah. yeah, please understand, those are good foods. Are you all with me? Those are perfectly good foods. We probably should use them in a little bit of, what shall I say, especially if I'm overweight, right? I should use them sparingly, perhaps, or conservatively. But those are good foods. She's talking about coconut oil, which, by the way, is 96% saturated fat. So coconut, uh, coconut oil itself is bad for me. Now, it doesn't oxidize very much because saturated fat does not oxidize unless you heat it hot enough to burn. You all with me on that? Um, you know, they used to cook french fries in saturated fat. Did you know that in this country? Because Americans heard that unsaturated fat is good for you. And of course, now all the places are French frying with French fries, and unsaturated fat is still bad for you. But um, your question uh, about coconut is let me answer it this way coconut is a good food, just like any nut is a good food. Could you get too much of it? Yeah, you could. And interestingly, I'm going to go there. I'll, I'll come back to that in, if I can. Since Dr. Sabate did the study of walnuts, all the nuts that we eat have been studied, and we see the same result. Uh, what I've got on the screen here is um, nut study findings, and we're going to call the amount of coronary disease events, death, or a heart attack that you didn't die from. We're going to call that 100% in America. That's the red line. And these people are getting less than one uh, handful of nuts a week. But we put people in the laboratory and we give them nuts one to four times a week, a handful. Bigger people, bigger hands, so it's kind of dose related. Is that making sense what I'm trying to describe? And uh, some people, we give them nuts almost every day. 
and the reduction in death from heart disease or events, which are mostly deaths, uh, if you get nuts, the yellow is this bar. What is the approximate decrease in heart disease events because people got nuts up to four times a week? It looks like about almost 20 dozen, 18 to 20 percent, just because they had a handful of nuts uh, one to four times a week. But it was replaced by it. Are you all with me on that? I have a cartoon, I don't know if I'll have it in this picture, but this, I think I mentioned this yesterday. This fellow says to the doctor, should I eat the diet before or after meals? <laughs> the average American is taking a handful of nuts, let's say, after meals, their regular meal. They're worse off. Are you all with me on that? I'm repeating myself. I saw some of you not nodding. It's okay, but it really helps me, folks. I'm an old teacher. How many of you have ever been a school teacher? Can I see your hands? Oh, five of you. Uh, I don't even have to think about it. I know what everybody in the room is doing all the time. You know what I'm talking about? I don't have to think I, I spent years in the classrooms. And it just happens. And when you don't respond to me with your face, it makes me feel like I didn't make it clear. So please do as much as you can. First was, now, there was another hand beside here that I... Oh, that's right. And then I'll come over here. Yes. She's asking, even if you took the oil out of an avocado, I'll say it again. So listen up. Every oil you take out of a plant oxidizes and it is bad for you. Among the things that is bad for you, which scares me the most, is that it's carcinogenic. Are you all with me? It causes cancer. Uh, very interesting. Um, would you agree that almonds are the most nutritious of the nuts? A good question. Would I agree that almonds are the most nutritious? I want to say carefully to you, no. I would like to convince all of you, if I had the time, that there is no miracle food. What do I mean by that? I would like you, I would like you to get to the place where you don't have it in mind that, ah, this food, this is what's really good for you. I'm talking only plants, are you all with me? It doesn't matter what plants you eat, folks, it's good for you. And there is no one, even garlic is not a miracle food. And uh, would it be okay if you ate nothing but garlic? I suppose. Uh, if, if you can stand yourself. Uh, why, do I, why do I want to emphasize that? Because what happens is we, we, we get the idea that some food is a miracle food. And that becomes our health plan and maybe we ignore other things that we ought to be thinking about. So don't look for a miracle food, a miracle seed, or this or that. Uh, just remember, it doesn't matter what edible plants you eat, folks, they are good for you. And probably, almost any of them, except the high fat plants, you could probably live off of just one plant if you had to. There's a, there's a tribe in, in South America one of my major professors told us this story. He learned that there was this tribe in the mountains of South America that was getting 97% of their calories from sweet potatoes. And he thought, I'm going to take my graduate students down there and we're going to study these folks and help them improve. So they went down there with about 10 PhD candidates in nutrition. And they pitched their tents and they began to watch these people and take data, you know, that's what they're trained to do. Uh, write down everything they saw them do. And the long story short is, they couldn't find anything wrong with these people. <laughs> they finally packed up their bags and went home. <laughs> you could live on nothing but sweet potatoes if you wanted to. It might not be the best thing in the world, but the point is, folks, there's no miracle food. No, every, now, everybody knows you've got to have blueberries at least, right? That's not true. Because raspberries are just about as good as blueberries. But then you should at least have blueberries or raspberries. Right? 
No, because strawberries are almost as good as raspberries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That matter, same thing is true. Do you understand what I'm trying to get you to see, folks? Yeah. Don't get focused on some food. This, this is the great thing to have. Don't do that, folks. It misleads people and misleads you. Uh, although you could live on nothing but blueberries. I would kind of enjoy that, actually. But, uh, <laughs> all right.
and uh, I was asked to do a lecture on it one time, this is six, seven years ago at least, I thought I knew the answer. But I have the, pr I have the wonderful privilege of being friends with a number of eminent scientists. Some of them were my professors in graduate school, and others I've worked with and so forth. Uh, including Ben Carson, did you see the film of me talking to him at the beginning? And uh, so I called up about six people. I, I, could, I could go through and give you their names, but these are all, one of them was the head of the nutrition department at Andrews University for 20 years. And uh, a number of other friends. And the last one I called up was Neil Bentley. Most of you know that name. He's the current president at Umar. Has been now for 10 years, almost 11. And I said, Neil, what's your opinion? He said, Jim, we don't know. Let's just make it 50-50. 50-50 what? 50 raw, 50 cooked. Are you all with me? And I apologize to you if you're a big, if you're a big supporter of raw foods. Uh, but your science, science will not support that opinion. Are you all with me? Why, why cook anything at all? Because in many foods, folks, the nutrients cannot be easily obtained without breaking the structure down with heat. I'll give you an example. You get eight times as much lycopene, that's one of the, what we call, uh, there's several words for it, the micronutrients, uh, over 10,000 nutrients found in plants that we did not know about. The main nutrients you all know about is fat, carbohydrate, fat, carbohydrate, protein, fiber and minerals, and vitamins. You know about those minerals, those uh, 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 things in food. Besides those, there's 10,000, over 10,000 nutrients we have found in plants, not in animal products. And they're all beneficial. They were called phytochemicals. Phyto is a big word for plant in the beginning. That's not the best word. I won't take time to describe it because of time. But in any case, um, because of the structure of the plant, we can't get some of those nutrients, in, in, especially maybe in the quantity that is in that plant, without heating it. Y'all with me on this? On the other hand, heating food does, destroy isn't quite the word, but it renders unusable some chemicals, if you will, in plants, some nutrients in plants. So this is why Neil said to me, Jim, why don't we just make it 50-50? Because we don't have science folks to prove one or the other. Are you all with me? Is that clear enough to everybody? i got to keep going. Now, when you ask questions, folks, please don't tell a story. I'm struggling for time. Are you all with me? Yes. Just ask a question. Just ask at the end. Well, you can ask right now, but don't tell me a story. I'm just concerned about time. I just want, I can't remember the questions. Okay, but when you do, raise your hand and I'll stop. Are some of the sprouting seeds um, any better? Beneficial? Uh, there are some nutrients in the seed that are hard to get if you don't cook the seed. Y'all with me on this? It's the same idea. Um, and so if you soak it, your body is able to get a little more of the nutrients. And if it grows, maybe a little more still. But folks, uh, and my wife does some of these things like some of you do, don't get focused on the fact that you have to sprout seeds. Y'all with me on this? You'll get nutrients from the seeds, especially if you grind them up. If you don't grind up a hard seed, your body doesn't get very much nutrients. Some always, right? Y'all with me on the idea? Mm -hmm. Try not to get focused, folks, on one of these things that becomes kind of your mantra about nutrition. Now you're okay. So does cooking sometimes release or make something more available? That's what I just said a few minutes ago. Okay. And I gave you the example of tomatoes. Did I finish the example? You get eight times as much lycopene when you cook a tomato and eat it as when you eat it raw. Y'all with me in this? And lycopene is one of over 10,000 nutrients besides the usual nutrients. Are y'all with me in that? We talk about it. These things are all useful for us. Okay. Are you with me? What if you get nuts uh, almost every day? What's the decrease in heart disease, uh, in events like death? It's over 50%, isn't it? It's like maybe uh, 52, 
three to fifth, something like that. This is incredible, folks. Just because you ate a handful of nuts, isn't that amazing? But it was what? Replacement. If you ate those nuts and changed nothing else, you actually would be worse off because of the additional fat. Even if you didn't take the fat out. Just too much fat, folks. It's bad for us because it tends to make us gain weight and so forth. Oh, I, I should just notice it works for men or women. It works when you're young. This means less than, less than 50, older than 50. You understand what I mean when I say it works? You see the descending height of the, of the bars. Are y'all with me on this? Yes. Okay, I see some people don't nod when I look at you. Please, folks, talk to me with your face. Uh, and it works for people who are vegetarians or not. Doesn't work quite as well, does it? Yeah. Uh, it even works when you don't get exercise, but not quite as well when you do. Y'all with me on this. Very interesting. Even if you're overweight, it works. Body mass index normal, body mass index too high, it doesn't work quite as well, but it still works, doesn't it? Very interesting that uh, this one. And what the, in the graphs I'm showing you is, is the, the average of all the nut studies. One nut study might be a little higher and a little lower, something like that, but this, the, those bars on the screen represent all the nut studies. They were based on replacement. And this man says, Doctor, should I get the diet before or after meals? Now, here's a quick little trimmer on how this saturated fat thing works. That green sac is the gallbladder. It's tucked up under the liver. The liver. <laughs> and uh, the pancreas over here is behind the stomach. Uh, makes bile. And that is stored. I'm sorry, the liver makes the bile which comes out of the liver here. And if the valve is closed off, the bile is stored in the gallbladder. And the idea is that this bile comes down here, actually passes through the pancreas, comes back into the small intestine, just about this far past the end of the stomach. And the purpose of the bile, please notice this description, it helps digest the fat. It does not digest, it just helps. Um, bile, if you dry it, is essentially pure cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And um, it is a little bit like detergent. If you put the dishes in the sink water uh, and you're an ordinary American, what do you soon see floating on the water? Some, some fat, grease oil. Um, then you put some detergent in it, swish it around, and you don't see that fat anymore. There's a word we use for that, you'll be familiar. We say that the soap or the detergent is emulsified as fat. It actually surrounds each little tiny particle of fat with water-soluble stuff, so it's, the fat's now all through the water. Y'all working on the idea of how that works? We call it emulsification. The bile does something similar to that, to the fat that we eat. If it wasn't for the bile, instead of taking six to eight hours to digest or to empty the stomach and, and do a pretty good job digesting it, it might take several days. So the bile emulsifies the fat. It's a little more complicated than that, but we still use that word so that the digestive enzymes can chop up the fat and they can be absorbed. Now, um, that's the common bile duct. And here's another diagram of it that I meant to leave on the screen long enough to just say that uh, this bile gets into the small intestine and helps make the fat digest quickly enough so it doesn't take too long. Uh, there is an interesting thing that happens, however, because the bile is almost pure cholesterol. Um, and it's used to help digest the fat. The liver, in, watch this, this is an important point in this description. The liver increases the amount of bile if I have what kind of fat? So the more saturated fat, the, the more of the fat that I eat that's saturated, the more what my body makes. Yeah. Now the problem there with that is that the bile 
uh, which is almost pure cholesterol, gets what? Into the what? So if I eat saturated fat, the amount of cholesterol found in my blood will be what? Higher? That's the issue here. And this is why saturated fat is bad for your heart. You all with me on the idea? If your body makes more bile at the fat center, that ends up in our bloodstream as cholesterol. For most people, if you eat fiber, it doesn't get reabsorbed. Interestingly enough, I'll try to talk to that in a minute. Um, so an increase of coronary heart disease is the result. The lifetime risk of ischemic, now that's a fancy word that just means a constriction of blood flow. Ischemia, you know that term, don't you? It means that something has caused the blood to not flow as freely as it should. The lifetime risk of ischemic heart disease was reduced by 31% in those who consume nuts frequently, and by 37% in male vegetarians compared with non-vegetarians. Higher consumption of all fruit or dried fruit was associated with more risk of lung, prostate, and pancreatic cancers. Amazing, folks, how the Edenic dietary plan just is so beneficial for us. 50 years ago, we didn't have the data, but the Surgeon General said, and he, he, he felt like he could just see this, even though we didn't have the studies. He said, can you believe this, that heart disease was almost entirely preventable. He just looked at peoples around the world and what they ate, got to thinking about this whole thing. And this is a long time ago. When most of us in this room were not born or were little kids, right? Or young kids. That's how long ago we were getting a message about this. Today you can erase that word. What did John McDougall say? Entirely preventable. All right. Um, let me pass this up. It's kind of a summary and go to this interesting story. Uh, the first study that was ever done to see if you replace some saturated fat with unsaturated fat was done in Finland. Finland and the U.S. are always competing each other to see how many people we can kill with lifestyle. We're always in competition. So they did this study in Finland. In two hospitals, we won't name them, uh, and they, uh, this is the death rate from heart disease, pretty close to the same same uh, number of people per hundred th per thousand patients um, in the hospitals, and they they decided to change the diet. This was done in 1975. That's a long time ago. How many years ago was that? Almost 50 years, right? Uh, so there were other people besides the Surgeon General that said, "We're going to try to see if we can make a difference here," and. Uh, the dietary intervention, interestingly enough, they only did two simple things, amazing, two things. They took cow's milk, took the fat out, and replaced it with what? Soy oil. Soy oil. And instead of letting them have butter, they gave them what? Margarine. Don't you all know that margarine is bad for you? <laughs> and, but that's what they did. Why? You probably know this, but let me just quickly summarize. Even that long ago, scientists already were understanding that saturated fat was causing a problem with heart disease. And margarine, folks, is made from unsaturated fats. And what they do is they partially saturate it. The proper term is partially hydrogenated. But they stop adding hydro they stop hydrogenating it as soon as it's solid. So there's quite a bit less saturated fat in margarine in comparison to butter. Are y'all listening? Now there's a problem there with trans fats that we didn't know about until the last 15 to 20 years. But that's what was going on. And this was done 50 years ago. So now um, 
But do you get the point is, they're replacing a fair amount of fat that's saturated with what? Unsaturated fat. And after, let's see, what's the time frame? It was just, uh, I can't remember for sure, I'm, I'm not sure it's on the slide, but after uh, a couple of years or something like that, notice this. Uh, the amount of cholesterol found in their blood had decreased just because they were replacing some unsaturated, some saturated fat with unsaturated fat. So this, even back that far, we knew that the saturated fat was an issue for the heart. And I shouldn't take the time to tell you a story, but I am. My stepfather, my German stepfather, was a cynic and uh, raised on a ranch, lived like all ranches there. And this guy was uneducated. I don't think he graduated from high school, although he, he was a reader. And you, can, you can educate yourself in reading. But in, in spite of the fact that he had such a limited education, this is amazing to me. We would be eating our steaks. Didn't I tell you yesterday how we cook the steaks over the fire? And he would say, I don't know if you'll get this joke, but let's see if you do. He would say, well, maybe I should prime it just a little bit. Because what we understood then was that somehow there was some, uh, some cholesterol clumps getting into our bloodstream. Clear back then, it was already understood that cholesterol was an issue in this thing. So here's what he would say as we're eating our steaks. He'd say, uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to get rid of the blood lumps in my cholesterol stream. <laughs> you didn't get it, that's all right. But an old farmer who knew nothing already knew that that uh, there were these cholesterol lumps, if you will, in his... Uh, and look at, look at how much the death rate dropped. How much? Oh, just because you replaced some saturated fat with some unsaturated fat in the milk and in the butter. Isn't that remarkable? That's astonishing, right? And uh, now here is the... Uh, John, your wife isn't here is tonight. I'm going to ask you a question. I can't remember her first name. Tina. Tina. This is the summary paragraph at the end of the study that was published about this. Does that make some sense for you? They published these things in professional journals. Right? We feel the findings of our study justified the conclusion. Now, here's something Americans never understood. This only worked for men, not for women. Do you remember when they, oh, this would be 50, 15 years ago, we were promoting the use of olive oil and just any oil. In fact, I was doing a stop smoking program with my head elder, who was a physician, an older man, a wonderful guy. And he was helping me do the stop smoking program. And without talking to me at all, he brought in a bottle of oil and said, you know, when you need to eat, this is good for you. <laughs> what can I say? This guy's loved by the whole community, right? And. Uh, but, and I, I, I won't sidetrack on this too much, but folks, it is amazing how uninformed we are. Um, this, uh, this, this did not work for women. It worked for men, not for women. Amazing. How many people would you have to ask on the street before somebody would know that? Are we uninformed? Yes. And misinformed a lot? Yes. Anyway, that in men, a cholesterol ring diet, considering this death, coronary heart disease. Uh, the data, that's what the word they means, the data also indicate that total mortality was favorably affected by this diet. What would be a favorable effect on total mortality? That it was reduced. Now I'm going to show you the rest of the paragraph. If Tina, if you said to Tina, I love you, dear, though not conclusively. <laughs> you would be in big trouble. John and I go back a long ways. It was in the town. No, it wasn't, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, what do they mean by that? Listen, folks, this is crazy stuff. They mean that the decrease was small enough that it was not statistically 
significant. You all kind of know a little bit about that, don't you? In terms of scientific studies data. And, uh, but the world has been told that uh, these oils are good for you. And you can't even conclude from the studies that you're actually any better off uh, when it comes right down to it. All right. Um, what's, by the way, I don't know if you caught this, I didn't. The conclusion that reduced uh, total mortality, that's the word I'm after. You might do a study, folks, on some people and decrease death from, let's say, liver cancer. But if something else got worse that wasn't before, that's a problem. Are you all with me? Yes. So we're dealing with this thing called total mortality. Are you all with me on that? There's lots of things you can die from. And that was the problem here. I'll just pass this up here because I need to get that. And uh, it turns out, watch this now when I'm trying to get there. Replacement studies conducted in Finland and then later they repeated in Los Angeles showed a 50% decrease in death from heart disease. Does that sound about like what we saw in the video, right? About a 50% decrease. Notice this. But increases in cancer made the total mortality, or if you were overall death rate, what? Isn't this something? This is, a, this is amazing. Even if I get these oils that are supposed to be good for me, what did I say at the very outset this evening these oils cause? Cancer. And the studies have shown that. Uh, and some of you are interested in the references, of course. I'm happy to provide them. But. Now let's take a look at this from a slightly different perspective. Let's let this bar represent all the fat that Americans are out getting. Uh, what do you suppose the S is? And the U? And this is about half the calories that Americans get, not quite half. This is what the study did. It replaced some red with greenish. In other words, it's the same thing we've talked about. It replaced some saturated with unsaturated. Y'all with me on this? That's what the study did in general. What's the significance that the tops are the same height? Replacement. Take some out, put some in, right? Take saturated out, add unsaturated. Okay. Now, this is what Americans thought they were supposed to do. <laughs> Doctor, shall I eat the olive oil before or after meals? Are you all with me? Yes. They're worse off. Uh, the average American is getting about 40% of his or her calories from fat. If you go to your doctor and they decide you have coronary artery disease, they're supposed to put you on the American Heart Association diet. Which cuts the total fat down to what? Is that good? Yes, it's good. It's not good enough, but it is good. All right? It's some, it's some advantage. Anytime you cut the total fat down, folks, if you're not where you're supposed to be. If you're where you're supposed to be, don't cut it down some more. That wouldn't be good for you. Are you all with me on that? Anytime you cut it down from where people are generally at, uh, you see a benefit. Uh, oh, man, by the way, what's the meaning of this. How can we? Try to cut the saturated fat down to as little as possible. Y'all with me? And you kind of understand why, don't you? Because the saturated fat makes the body make more bile, which ends up in the bloodstream as cholesterol, correct? Go with me on that pathway. Now here's a drawing of an artery. And the artery is made up of two layers of muscle, outside and inside layer. And then there's this lining. Remember that from yesterday? Anybody remember what the name of that lining is? It's epithelial or endothelial tissue. But, but the, in, in particular, in the artery, doesn't matter, remember what it's called? The intima. The lumen is the name for the inside of the people, how big the pipe is. Anyway, uh, just a drawing. There's the outside layer, the inside layer of muscle, and the intima. And um, there's, the, there's the plaque 
And did, uh, you remember from yesterday that the platforms were under the lining or the engine. And what percentage of heart attacks take place because the soft plaque breaks through the lining? 99% of the heart attacks are a result of some soft plaque oozing through the lining, which causes an instant clot. And I'll show you some actual pictures of the artery in a moment. Now, uh, the artist has tried, it's not a very good representation, to show you that the lining is in poor health. Y'all with me on that? It's kind of a piece there. It's not a good representation. It still should be all there and somehow indicated that maybe there's a weak spot. But he's doing the best job he can. All right. So atherosclerosis is made of two Greek words that mean mush and hard. Here's what's going on. You all know about hardening of the arteries, right? The body seems to understand that that soft black is dangerous. And it's desperately trying to harden it. If it was completely hard, could it ooze through the lining and cause a heart attack? No. You all with me? So, hardening of the arteries is the body's effort to try to deal with this thing I'm doing to myself that I shouldn't be doing. The first physician, scientist actually, but he's a physician uh, as well, from the University of California in San Francisco, that wanted to study this phenomenon could not get money from the government, the National Institutes of Health, because everybody knew you could not reverse heart disease. Knew? I have tremendous respect for this fellow. He's not a believer. He's a good, strong atheist, but I have tremendous respect. He broke his neck and raised over $3 million privately to conduct the very first study to see if you could make plaque go away, which everybody knew you couldn't. His name, his, his name was Dean Arnish. Oh, yes. And um, he took a group of 24 men who had had angiograms, and he could see all of the three arteries and measure maybe each little centimeter how much that part was closed and he would average the closure of the three arteries throughout their length and found when he separated at random this group of 25 men into two groups of 12 and 13, I think they may have been 24 men, I can't remember now, uh, that their average, in one group, the average blockage was about 40%. Some much more, some much less. Are you all with me want to kind of describe? He put them on a plant regime, just like you and I are talking about, except he took away the four categories of plants that are high in fat. So instead of their fat intake being, you know, 25, 30, 35, 40 percent, um, and you and I, if we're on a plant regime and we're, we're using the four foods, you know, we probably are about uh, 30% of our calories from fat, which is okay, maybe a little less than that. But he cut their, he cut the calories from fat clear down to 10% by using only plants and not the high fat plants. Are y'all with me? Mm -hmm. And uh, even though everybody knew you could not reverse <laughs> plaque, he found in 12 months that the black decreased by how much? That's pretty good, wouldn't you say? For the first effort uh, that had ever done some research. Now the uh, other 12 men were put, I told you, on the American Heart Association diet. And their average plaque was about the same. Just above 40. And, at the, and he put, listen to this, he put them on the American Heart Association diet. The diet your doctor puts you on if you have heart disease. Y'all with me? What's the fat intake for that? 30% of the calories, of the total calories, 30% is fat. 
So that's better than the average American, which is getting about 40% of their calories from fat. And in that one year, how much did their black what? <laughs> Even on the American socialist diet, their plaque was increasing. Boy, aren't we in trouble in this country? You have heart disease, the doctor puts you on this diet. Even if you follow it, you're still worse off. Isn't that something? All right. Has that diet been updated uh, too much? The American I don't know, but I haven't heard that it has been. Who is that? Yeah. Okay. I, uh, I'll confess I don't know, but I think I've ever seen it in the literature that it changed. This is an actual photograph artery, cross-section, remember that word from yesterday, coming out and chopped off. Of course, this was taken after this person died. And this is the, uh, I guess I have some arrows to do it. That's the uh, inside of the artery. And all of this is flat. The only part where blood is not. By the way, this is a new word now. This is the part of the plaque that is still soft. The word atheroma means soft. So we call this the atheromatous core. Okay with that? Atheroma. And um, all the rest of this, let me use my pointer. All of this, the body has done what with it? Hardened it. Why? How to protect this man from a heart attack. Otherwise, the whole thing would be soft wax. And the fact that there's quite a bit of, and, and this is where the blood is flowing, probably 15%, uh, still open, 85% blockage. The fact that there's so much space between where we don't want a clot to form, and the core which could cause the clot. Are y'all with me? Mm -hmm. it, this is pretty safe. The body's doing a pretty good job. See, protecting this uh, person from heart attack. Um, although the ischemia is pretty strong, and you know, you probably would, with a 85% uh, blockage. Let me tell you something you might be interested in knowing. When you go to the position and they put you on a tre treadmill and do what we call a stress, a stress test, and sometimes they'll actually inject something into the blood and do some imaging. Uh, you cannot detect a, clock, a blockage unless it's greater than 65%. One day I said in a, in a lecture, 60%. I had read that. A cardiologist friend of mine was sitting in the lecture and she said, you know, Brother Packett, it's actually 65%. <laughs> so the average person who gets a stress test and is told by the doctor you're fine, may have blockages up to This is crazy. How many of you knew that before you came in this room? Let me see your hands. One person. Is that a physician back there? Uh, are we uninformed or not? Yes. Yes. I had a stress test and they said that I had blockages of 40 to 90 percent. So they do. It, it, there, I'd like to ask my cardiologist friend about that. I think she would have something to say as to the, how that person drew that conclusion. It's a good point, Jim. Dr. Kim, uh, did you hear what he said? Um, why would a physician say that if you can't detect the blockage? Did they do some, uh, some positron scanning? PET scanning? Or something? Who knows? I think that's based on Alright. <clears throat> um, let's look at another one. If I can get past these arrows. <laughs> this is the atheromatous core. This is all plaque. Y'all with me? This is the lumen, we call it. And you can actually see the lining in this one. See that? Can you see that? The intima? Uh, what do you think about this plaque? It's pretty close to the margin there, isn't it? Probably kind of dangerous stuff. Um, I'll try to get past these arrows again. My apologies. 
showing these different parts. This man died. And the atheroma discord was kind of diffused about like that, perhaps. But this is where it did what? It broke through the lining. And within seconds, this clot formed and killed him. Y'all with me on this? It's the, and what percentage of heart attacks are caused with this phenomenon? 99%. So then if someone is in, well, for heart attack, has been in bad shape like this, and then they change their diet on that day, something we're talking about, then how does this disintegrate? How does this lessen without becoming a danger? You know? Yeah, very good question. Could you all hear her? Yeah. Um, and, doc, and Dr. McDougall, what did he say about this? It is reversible. Um, the soft black, it's clear from Dr. Ornish's studies, and since then, other scientists have done these studies and showed the same thing. The soft black, in fact, in one case, Dr. Esselstyn in his book, How to Reverse Heart Disease, shows a picture of a colleague of his, a physician, who in 12 months, uh, they, they caused all of the soft plaque in his artery to disappear in 12 months. Uh, the hard plaque, there's no research that shows that the hard plaque will go away. It probably would, but it would probably take a very long time. But the, the, please get this point, folks. It is the soft plaque that is the big issue. Y'all with me on this? The uh, hard plaque only in, well, hard and soft together, filling the artery only happens in one out of 100 heart attacks. You all with me? Okay. How does that 99% correlate with the reason that we just showed us earlier slide with, with the flow of people going down 5%? Okay. Well, we're talking heart attacks. And in that study, all they were looking at was how much of the artery was closing or opening. So, well, Dean Arnish, at that time, um, we were just starting down this road. He, the whole community was delighted to know that if you put people on a plant regimen without those four high-fat plants, you could make soft plaque go away. Uh, nobody's ever shown that, that I know of, that hard plaque disappears. It probably would but very slowly. But it's not an issue because it's the soft plaque folks that's the issue. How does this relate to the amount of calcium that someone might consume as a supplement? Very interesting question on calcium. Most everybody knows in this room that one way they see how your artery is doing is to do a calcium scan. And what that's really doing is uh, noticing that uh, uh, calcium is part of this hard plaque that's building up. Um, In the Women's Health Initiative, I think there was about 140,000 women in this. There was a subgroup of women. This, this was the study, folks, that revealed that hormone replacement therapy was actually bad for you and not healthy. You remember that? I think it was in 04 that, this, that it was in the, on the radio and the TV that day. And overnight, 35% of the women in this country that were taking hormone replacement therapy stopped using it. Do y'all remember that story a little bit? Not everybody's saying yes. Okay, well, there was a big study on all these thousands of women that, that were using HRT that showed that there were problems. And instead of reducing heart disease, in many women it was more, and it was supposed to also help with other issues that it didn't really help with much. So, but anyway, there was a subgroup of women that were given a thousand uh, milligrams of calcium and 1,500 units of, I was going to say it's D, to see if they could improve their situation with osteoporosis, right? Don't you guys all know vitamin D helps osteoporosis, right? And so forth. Uh, there, were, there were fewer fractures among those women, but more heart disease. 
And in the, in the wonderful world of research, they just say, this should be studied. That's a mocking thing I, I'm saying. Are you all with me on that? They don't even deal with it. They say, well, we should study that. And these women uh, were dying of heart attacks because of this regimen of calcium and vitamin D. So there's an issue. We tell people, you don't, it's rare that you need to take calcium. That's not what makes your bones stronger. What makes your, I have a whole hour lecture on this. I'll just tell you two quick things. What makes your bones stronger is stressing them. You may not know this. Anytime you lift up a heavy weight, your bones bend. When they bend, they become electrified, and we believe that's the, me the mechanism which makes calcium come and be made, well, might be made more available for the bone to make strong bones. And um, the other thing, uh, well, there's three things. The biggest thing, folks, for osteoporosis is that before age of 18, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, up to, up to uh, 18 years of age, if you can get people to live right and stress their bones, they can make a lot of bone easily. When is it that we live like there's no tomorrow? But that's a big issue, folks, especially women, because you know this is a bigger issue for women than men, osteoporosis. Men get it, but they get it about 15 years later than women. Um, you, you can make a lot of bone easily. You gotta work hard, lift stuff, and eat right, and you can make a lot of bone. After 30 years of age, almost every American is losing 2% of their bone density in a year. And the menopause it steepens for about three years. So, but again, guess what? A plant regimen and activity uh, help. Well, anyway, this man died from that uh, uh, atheromatous portion oozing into the bloodstream. And, the, and that clot formed so quickly, folks, it caught the ooze. Got it? I see some of you are shaking your head. You're not sure. This is the uh, atheromatous area, if you will, and this is where it leaked in and the clock form, like in seconds. And there it is, causing the tragedy. Okay, let's hurry on. So what Ornish did was cut their fat intake down to what? And look at the saturated fat, very tiny amount. What did he, what did he make happen? Just, just, just to have you say it. With that diet, what, what would happen? Plaque disappeared. What percentage of the plaque? Over five, five and a half percent. Good. And um, what's the significance here? Very little saturated fat. Now, Caldwell Esselstyn, most of you know that name. He's probably the most notable man today who's worked on research. In fact, just recently, he, he finished a group of 200 people. Um, that he put on a plant regimen. He tries to get the fat down to 7%. He's really strict on any plant that has very much fat besides just those four. And it, it, he had tremendous results, except for one man who, well, a certain number of them were not adherent to the diet. What does that mean? They weren't following it completely. One man was close, but he did a few things he shouldn't have had, and he had a little incident. He didn't die. Everybody else in that whole cohort of people who were at risk for heart attacks did not have an incident in the guy. Really amazing. Well, look, if this makes you sicker, and uh, this makes you better, somewhere, somewhere in between it wouldn't get worse or better. Right? And it's pretty much agreed by everybody that around 20% fat intake uh, is safe. I taught college nutrition for 10 years, and I had my students keep track of 
for one month in the year. Keep track of everything they ate. See, pretty easy to do with two years. And at the end of that month, they were, of course, they made a report. And uh, if they wanted to, listen to this, if they wanted to, they could eat at Nevis' table, where they got a plant regimen, including some of these. Are you all with me? During those 10 years, virtually every student that ate at Nevis' table, and they could do this, by the way, because we were running the restaurant at that time. And those students, um, when they were in town, they had their lunch at the restaurant. We, we fed people off the street what we're talking about here. I'm not talking about eliminating these, but y'all with me. And uh, anyway, over those 10 years, the kids that ate at Nita's table, morning, noon, and night, fell their fat intake fell between 17 and 20 percent of their calories. So it just works that way when you, and this isn't restricting yourself in, in that sense, folks. Eat all you want, you, can, you could overeat, but follow this plan, and the fat intake is very easy in this realm. Okay. Um, Oh, this is the study that I referred to with Eselston, 198 patients. I'm just going to pass it up. I told you what essentially the result was. And this is a photograph off of the cover of a book I have on immunology. This is a picture on a microscope, on a microscope slide of a white blood cell. There's many different kinds of white blood cells. This guy we call the macrophage. It's a Greek word that means big eater. And I mentioned this yesterday, so we may not have been here. He travels around the body, millions of these things, uh, in the blood, traveling through bone. They can ooze through anything in the body. Amazing. And they're looking for stuff that shouldn't be there. And they uh, come up to something that shouldn't be there. Excuse me, here I promise I won't touch what you drink. And they and they ooze around it. And when the ooze touches on the other side, suddenly the thing is inside the cell. You got that? And uh, they, they do that to germs. And they do that to fatty particles in your blood. If there's too much fat in your blood, they'll grab some of it and try to hold it from hurting you. <laughs> And uh, let me show you uh, another drawing here. Etiology, as you know, means how it happens. So I'm going to, this is the artery with two layers. And what's the white ring called? The lining, the, intima, the endothelial tissue. Uh, I'm going to fill the whole screen with just this much. And um, so now we're going to see it as cells. And here is the inside, uh, that layer of cells right there is the intima. And these are the muscle cells. Are you all with me? So um, that's the intima. And here's what happens in the etiology of the plaque. Some kind of a chemical assault. You know that in cigarette smoke, I think I mentioned this, there's over 10,000 poisons. And many of those get in the blood. And you probably know this. Smokers get more heart disease. Because some of those chemicals will do what I'm about to show you. There's other ways that this can happen. I'm going to show uh, the chemical insult to this cell as a dent. Did you see the dent? Want to see it again? Um, in case you didn't see the dent. See it right there? Okay. It's not a dent, folks. It's a chemical. 